Hello, world. Today, I want to invite all of you, welcome you into my world, the world of deaf and hard of hearing people. We are a small minority, but I want to offer you a window, a glimpse into the education of deaf and hard of hearing children. Every deaf and hard of hearing child is unique. We have deaf and hard of hearing children that are born profoundly deaf, such as I was, to deaf parents. Other children have varying levels of hear lo hearing loss. Some can hear, some have partial hearing. Other children are born hearing and then become postlingually deaf. Technology is rapidly evolving and is impacting the lives of deaf and hard of hearing people across the world. We have access to television and movies through captioning. We have interpreters that can interpret and facilitate communication, just as there's an interpreter here voicing for me today. All of these things are possible when people have language and access to communication. The advent of digital hearing aids and cochlear implants have proved successful for many deaf and hard of hearing children and helped them to grow and to hear. What I can tell you, though, is in my over 30 years of experience in the field of deaf education, that does not work for every child because every deaf and hard of hearing child is special and unique. We have to look at that child, the family they are born into, their community, their environment. A deaf child born to deaf parents is in a, immediately a barrier-free environment, a language-rich environment where they're able to have communication and incidental learning is happening. But a deaf child born to hearing parents may not have that barrier-free environment, may not have access to that incidental learning unless parents are engaged, fully engaged with that child. But if they're not, that can be a barrier to their language acquisition and their development and growth. I want to take this opportunity now to share with you a story about one young child, Chantel. I recall about 10 years ago, sitting in my office working, my clinical director came to me and she sat down across from my desk and said, we have a new referral. A young girl, 12 years old, she's currently residing in another state. They think she might be deaf, but she's still in diapers. I said, she's 12 and still in diapers? My clinical director said, I don't know if we can take a child still in diapers. Our school has a policy. We will bring any child in for 90 days to see if we can help them thrive and educate them. My clinical director said, OK, let's try this. She took her team out across state lines and arrived at a hospital facility. Walking into the hospital, she was led through a stark, hollowed, long hallway by a nurse. The nurse led her to a door and pointed. This is the room. My clinical director looked at, through this tiny window and saw in the room a little girl sitting on the floor, rocking back and forth. My clinical director asked the nurse, can you introduce me? The nurse opened the door my clinical director walked in, and this little girl sat staring aimlessly out the window at the trees, unaware that anybody was in the room with her. The nurse said, this is what she does day after day. We bring her food, she eats. We bring her to bed at night, and then in the morning, she's here once again, rocking back and forth on the floor, staring out at the trees. This was her life for 12 years. My clinical director and her team came back to my office. I said, how did it go? 
she told me about this little girl and I was moved. I said, bring her here. Let's see if we can teach her. Let's see if we can help her to thrive. My director said, oh, this will be a challenge, but I agree. They brought her to our doors and one year later, that girl could sign 25 to 30 words. We host an annual Thanksgiving dinner at our school with staff, students, and the students' families, and I recall that little girl sitting there with her grandmother across the table at that Thanksgiving dinner. Her mother had passed several years before. So she sat across from her grandma, and she signed grandma, and she signed this. Her grandmother looked at her, not understanding, and a staff member sitting nearby interpreted, and she said, she's telling you she's hungry. One by one, the tears rolled down that grandmother's face. Finally, this little girl could tell her what she wanted. That young girl went on to stay with us until she graduated. She's now in a group home, and she's able to sign 50 to 75 words, and she has an amazing life now. But imagine if she had language, education, communication, at a young age, imagine how much more rich her world could have been. Now let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born deaf. My parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, all deaf. I am fourth generation deaf. My siblings also profoundly deaf. I was born to a barrier-free language-rich environment. I went into school, and the school that I attended had an oral program. At home, I had full access to sign language, and so my educational journey was successful. And by the time I was ready to go into high school, I had a strong language foundation. And I decided I wanted to leave the deaf school to try public school. And I told my parents, and they said, are you sure? And I said, absolutely, I want to know what a public school experience is like. And so they encouraged me to go ahead. We talked to our school district. I was currently living in Pelham at the time, and I told them I wanted to go into the public school. They told my family they didn't have services for deaf and hard of hearing children within our town. However, there was another school in Westchester that offered services for deaf and hard of hearing students. So I was enrolled in that school, and there was a small group of us deaf and hard of hearing students, but I was fully mainstreamed with all hearing peers. I had full access to communication and my classes because I had a sign language interpreter with me throughout the entire day. During my classes, I also had a note taker by my side so I could actively participate in my classes. Some people ask the reason for the note taker. Can you imagine trying to watch an interpreter and take notes? That would be impossible to try to read my notes after. Anyway, so that was why I had a note taker with me. And so I had beautiful, beautiful notes to refer to after class. That journey through education in a public school was a wonderful experience and on par with my experiences at a deaf school. However, what was lacking, what was challenging, was my interaction, that face-to-face -face communication with my peers in a public school. An ASL interpreter was always required, a third person, until those hearing peers felt comfortable enough to write back and forth or gesture with me. Now, I love sports. And so I decided back then to join the basketball team. And there was a couple of us that were deaf and hard of hearing that joined the team, and we were excited to go. By about the third game, the coach came to me and said, we need to bench you. I didn't know why. I didn't understand what was happening. So I sat on the bench, and our team was doing terribly that game. By the fourth quarter, there was only two minutes left. They said, OK, go ahead, get out there and play. After those last two minutes, I sat back down. Ultimately, we lost that game. And after the game was over, I saw the athletic director and an interpreter approach me and call me in. And I knew something was up, but I wasn't quite sure what. I sat with the athletic director, and he explained, you are a great player. Here's the problem. Your family doesn't pay taxes to our town. Your family pays taxes to the town of Pelham. So the families here 
object to you playing because your family doesn't play taxes. What a huge barrier. It was a door slamming in my face. I decided that moment to quit the team. It wasn't worth it to stay. And I never became that MBA star I always aspired to be. But anyway, <laughs> so I graduated. I went on to college. And my very last year of college, I interned. I interned with the IRS. I was in the field of political science, and I thought, let me try the IRS. It was myself and another deaf colleague. The two of us arrived that very first day of our internship, met the manager. He says, boy, I got a job for you guys. He hands us this big box, and my friend and I take a look, and the manager says, listen, this project, it'll take you about two weeks. So the two of us, we were so excited to start our internship. We got right to work. We took a quick, quick lunch break, and then we went right back to working on this project. And then about two, two and a half days later, we had gone through the entire box, and so my colleague and I went to the manager, handed him the box, and said, we're done. The manager said, you're done? That's great, but understand, this is a government job. That was a two-week job. So here's how this goes. Nine to 10, you work. 10 o'clock, go down the hall, take a coffee break, read a newspaper, have a conversation for another hour, come back. 12 o'clock, take another hour for lunch, come back to work. My colleague and I looked at him. I knew in that moment that is not what I wanted to do with my life. I went back to my advisor and I said, you know what, government job, not for me. He said, I think you should go into education. And so I went into the field of education, and this is how I went, met my wife. And the three of us have, and the, my wife and I have three beautiful children. And all three of my children are hearing. Now, some of us may be wondering, some of you may be wondering, I'm fourth generation deaf, but my children are all hearing? How is that? Because my wife is hearing, I say her genes won out in the end. So I went into the field of education and I became an administrator. And over the years, I've seen so many barriers for our children. And today, I wanna to talk to you about one particular concept. It is the concept of the least restrictive environment, LRE. It began with the Education for Handicapped Children Act back in 1975 and has been revised and reauthorized over the years and now is known as IDEA. In concept, it was to provide all disabled children with an appropriate and free education. This be begins with an individualized education plan for deaf and hard of hearing children. And in theory, that should work outlining a customized plan for a child's journey to allow them to maximize their potential. But let's think about the parents with a deaf or hard of hearing child and how they begin to navigate that educational journey. They first begin by walking into an IEP meeting and they are faced with 15 to 20 professionals, audiologists, speech and language pathologists, so many individuals whose mission may not be aligned with what is in the best interest for their child. But do you know what's missing at that table? It is the deaf perspective, the deaf professionals in the field of deaf education. And ultimately, it is not necessarily the parents that make the decision, although that is true in some states, but for most states, it is the school districts, specifically the special education directors, who make the ultimate decision about where that child is placed. Is that right or wrong? I've had numerous conversations with various professionals. Many school districts have said, I previously taught deaf and hard of hearing children, and I know the one child I had before was able to succeed. I know I can replicate this and do this again. But let me bring you back to least restrictive environment. The idea is that special education children should be able to interact and maximize their potential by interacting with other normal children. Normal, let's think about that for a minute. And as you ponder that, let me tell you another story. The story about Cray Shell, who moved to the United States at the young age of six. 
When she arrived, she was immediately enrolled in a public school. She had a hearing family. They had just arrived from another country. She had no access to communication and no language foundation. When they arrived in their district, the special education director said, I have been able to teach and educate other deaf and hard of hearing children. I know I can do the same here. Kresha went into her class and faced barrier after barrier. She couldn't communicate directly with peers. She couldn't understand what was happening with her teachers or with her classes. Her parents searched because they saw how unhappy she was and found a deaf school. They brought her in for a tour, and the moment she walked through the doors and saw people signing and the access, she said, this is where I want to be, and it transformed her world. Eventually, they convinced the director to enroll her at the deaf school, and she became graduation speaker 12 years later. And when she stood up at the commencement, she said, I am proud to be deaf. I am proud to be female. Regardless of the color of my skin, we are all the same inside. I am normal. After her presentation at graduation, I went to her special education director and I said, what do you think now? And she said, she has completely transformed my perspective on LRE. What least restrictive environment does not look at is that the communication, modality, and preferences of deaf and hard of hearing children. Are they able to access their education directly from teachers or have social opportunities directly with their peers without the presence of an interpreter? They need a language-rich environment. Is the least restrictive environment right for every deaf and hard of hearing child? I would challenge you by saying LRE should stand for a language-rich environment when it comes to our deaf and hard of hearing children. In closing, I want to share that every deaf and hard of hearing child, every Chantel, every Crace Shell that is out there, we cannot have a one size fits all approach. Each of them is a unique and special child, and we must work together to make sure that every deaf child can be always able.